Welcome back to the Governance Podcast at the Center for the Study of Governance and Society at King's College London. My name is Irina Schneider, and I'm your host. Today, I'm really pleased to welcome Derek Wall, who is Associate Lecturer in Political Economy at Goldsmiths College. He is a former international coordinator of the Green Party of England and Wales and contested the Maidenhead constituency in the 2017 general election. His most recent book is called Eleanor Ostrom's Rules for Radicals, where he outlines the pragmatic nature of the Nobel Prize winner's work on governing the commons. Derek, thanks so much for joining us at the Governance Podcast. Um, Well, thank you so much for asking me. Uh, I'd love to discuss your latest work on Ostrom. Uh, You argue that there is a uniquely pragmatic dimension to her work. I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about what is her main contribution to the social sciences, first of all? Um, I don't know whether I would be as bold to say that it's unique, Um, but I would say that um, maybe one of the things which is distinctive and important about what she does is that she has an approach of trying to solve problems. So what I'm trying to do is kind of contrast her work with work from political science, which is more ideological in the sense that um, by ideology um, we might have some kind of collective identity as kind of socialists or classical liberals or whatever. And then what we're doing with that is exploring sets of pure principles And, you know, I don't think what she was trying to do was come up with axioms of political philosophy for all time and space. What she'd come up with is this kind of very pragmatic, problem-solving approach. So that, I think, it's it's maybe not unique, but it's relatively rare and it's, I think, very refreshing. Do you think that she was successful in moving beyond markets and states, or can we actually have her legacy claimed by one side more than the other? Um, Well, I think it's, you know, in a sense, she's almost unique doing that, because what we have, if we look at kind of political economy, is that most political economy is still in this binary that you have states and you have markets. And I think she's almost unique to say that economic activity covers a whole kaleidoscope of different forms of governance that get us beyond simply market exchange and the actions of state. And I think that's really bold. I mean, we're in a a society where, you know, in society and academically, um, there's a lot of kind of criticism of what might be termed neoliberalism, whether we think that's an appropriate term or not is another debate. And it's very much a kind of debate that, hey, there's too much market, we need more states, or the people opposing that would say there's too much state and we need more market. And Ostrom wasn't somebody who was radically against the state or radically against the market, but she almost uniquely was somebody who would theorise um, and analyse forms of economic governance that weren't purely state and market. And I think that really is unique. Do you think that it's really a third way between markets and states, or should we abandon that spectrum altogether? Well, I don't think we should abandon the spectrum, but I don't think she's, in a sense, doing the spectrum, because Mm. what people then say is maybe the commons are a third way. And, you know, I've learned from other Ostrom scholars that she wasn't simply saying state market commons, but actually there's a diversity of different institutions. And then there's also different ways in which states and markets and market exchange can interact. Mm -hmm. Um, So one of the things that I emphasise about her work is she had this kind of anti-slogan of no panaceas. And what people want to do is kind of ignore that and say she was the grand theorist of the commons. And, you know, she was the grand theorist of the commons, but she wasn't saying that the commons are a monolithic solution to everything. What she was saying is that you have a variety of different forms of governance and institutions and property rights. Um, And many of the most important are kind of very informal, decentralised and local. And that's kind of forgotten if we, um, you know, kind of say the commons is a third way. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, that's homogenising what she said too much. What is the relevance of her work for 
green politics and environment in um, particular? Well, I think it's absolutely massive um, because she um, and Vincent, and she would always say, I, I was lucky enough to interview her, and there's a nice video on YouTube for the, the Green Party magazine, Green World, and she would say... Um, you know, it's her work was always kind of related and done with Vince and her husband, and then they then related to a whole other network. So, you know, another controversy we might get onto later is the fact that they're very committed to methodological individualism, but they're much more kind of collectivist network scholars than we would find with scholars on the left. But to keep to the environment. Um, you know, before she met met Vincent, you know, right back in the late 1940s and 1950s, he was a political ecologist, that he was thinking about the political institutions we need to conserve nature. Um, you know, he was thinking of, um, you know, people in the West of America and, you know, Wyoming and, um, you know, how they would um, graze their cattle and cooperate and his, his early research when he became an academic was looking at water tables and hydrology. So, you know, he started off literally looking at environment and how we manage the environment as a political problem. And, um, you know, I'm obviously very committed to green politics, but green politics tends to be quite ideological in the sense of, well, we care about the environment. It's Donald Trump who doesn't care about the environment. And it's, you know, we've got to kind of be more environmentally friendly. And what the Ostroms were doing was saying, that's inadequate. What you have to do is look in very great detail at what works and what doesn't work. And I think one of the the kind of maybe problems of green politics is quite often we can be quite statist, that we would kind of say, um, you have the government, we're going to come up with policies, we're going to enact the policies and that will solve the problem. And what the Ostroms were doing, they were not radical anti-statists, but they would say we can't view the state as a black box. The states often get things wrong. And also, when you're looking at governing environmental resources and doing this in a sustainable way, quite often you have things which are informal, traditional, which the state can kind of snuff out. So I could kind of wax lyrically, I think, for for hours about their contribution to green politics. Um, And I'll try and keep it to a couple more minutes. Um... I mean, she was very happy, doesn't identify as kind of green, but she was very happy to be interviewed by me. She um, was going to be on one of the panels of the European um, Green Party to speak. I think she missed that because of ill health. So she was certainly interested in the, the green project. And a lot of her and Vince's values, you know, it's very much about, she talked about the seven generation rule and bringing in policies that would work for the next seven generations and decentralization, very concerned with kind of non-violence, um, equality, diversity. So in a, in a sort of ideological sense, there's lots of boxes that we can tick in terms of Ostrom and green politics, but I think the importance goes beyond that. Hmm. Well, typically when we think about the market, for instance, we see it as something that brings about socially optimal coordination between individuals on the basis of price signals and private property. But these kinds of mechanisms don't typically work in, in the global commons and common pool resources in general because people sort of don't own these resources. They don't own fisheries or oceans or forests. Um, so she emphasized the specific kind of social order that would help maintain these resources. And she stressed the importance of things like trust and communication and deliberate rulemaking at the local level. Um, But it seems that these kinds of mechanisms tend to only work on the local level, and it's very hard to scale them up to solve the challenges of climate change. So do you think that there's a limit to how much her framework is actually helping the environment or can help the environment? Um well, she didn't claim to be the kind of kind of goddess of everything, and I think you know social theory, like everything else, should be modular when it works at best. That you have different people doing different things, and then you kind of aggregate that, and that's reflected in her kind of practice as an academic and the kind of collective practice that she felt to deal with environmental problems. You needed natural scientists. Um, you needed um, you know political economists. Um, you know, so when she did practical research, it was normally with others. Mm -hmm. So she wasn't claiming to come up with this kind of solution for everything. Um, Though she was mainly focused on kind of local commons, 
I would stress that what she looked at is things as dilemmas and problems. She wasn't saying, if we localise everything, it then works. And she did do some a lot of work on climate change on a global level. And she would say, OK, I don't have a solution to this, if that's my understanding. But you have problems of trust at a global level. And she would be very explicit that you would have climate negotiators... And they're not going to get very far with negotiations and maybe sacrifices and reducing CO2 if there isn't trust. So I would say she might not have an automatic solution to building trust when you have global negotiations, but she was doing the research and actually posing this as a problem. Mm -hmm. And the kind of research she did where you would have kind of she'd run experiments, um, you know, she'd use game theory to look at how you promote um, competition overcome the, the traditional Nash equilibrium. I would say that those kind of things make it more, more make it easier to deal with the dilemmas that we have globally. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think if you're not using those, you're maybe rather disarmed. In what ways? Um, well, if what she's doing is posing the fact that you have issues of trust and you have issues of negotiation, and they're extremely difficult, and they may be almost impossibly difficult, but if you problematize them and then look at what creates better negotiations and better mm-hmm. trust, mm-hmm. you're opening up a space and it becomes less impossible. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, the classic stuff that she did was to look at kind of formal models that I'm sure a lot of people listening are familiar with, with, um, you know, Olson's, um, you know, collective action problems, free riders in the prisoner's dilemma. And the kind of formal models, as we know, would suggest that competition overalls cooperation. And in fact, they're quite challenging to a lot of market-based conventional economics, because in the conventional classical economics, we're self-interested, but that leads to a greater social good. And then, in fact, things like the prisoner's dilemma, um, they're actually quite subversive of that, because they would say that when we're self-interested, everybody loses. Right. Um, so again, I think it's one of the things with Ostrom is she does actually get us to kind of rethink a lot of the things which are very you know, we, we think of, of kind of traditional wisdoms. So, you know, it's quite often people say, hey, you're using game theory, and that's very right-wing and individualistic. But the kind of Nash equilibrium, if we really look at how it works, is actually quite subversive of Adam Smith. Well, let's look at a very specific policy example in terms of pollution. We know that there is an island of plastic waste floating in the Pacific Ocean the size of France, but there are no communities surrounding that piece of territory to manage that waste. How does Ostrom's framework cope with a truly global commons problem like that? One of the things I would say, I'm not an expert on, on plastic waste, is one of the kind of rules, I've got some kind of rules from radicals that I've kind of, uh, rules for, from Ostrom that I've taken, I don't know if you'd agree them or not, but one of them is be specific. Um, and plastic is like a huge problem but it's also an environmental icon. And what you have, I'm, I'm very kind of interested in people like the, the kind of Marxist philosopher Alta Zaire, I see a million miles away from Ostrom, and the, um, the, the Jewish-Dutch um, philosopher Spinoza. And they're kind of saying um, quite often there are things which have symbolic currency. And, you know, I'm not belittling plastics as a problem, But what you have is a range of environmental problems. And some of them you have very strong images and they become mobilized. And there are others that may be far more important ecologically, which are not easily mobilized by politicians. Um, So, you know, we've got to be careful of that. But I think with it be very specific that what happens is politicians and lobbyists come up with solutions but you need to look at in very detail, great, uh, very specifically, about whether the solutions work or not. Mm-hmm. So um, if we're looking at um, you know, the production of plastic, mm-hmm. the kind of Ostrom approach would be to say, um, you know, we might theorise why there's the waste, looking at kind of environmental conditions, because ocean currents come in, as well as human psychology. And then what we might do is like case studies where you reduce the amount of plastic and then you see what works with them and what doesn't work. And then you come up with some design features and then you develop policy. 
So what she's about is kind of having method. She's not about there's one approach that works in all circumstances, Mm -hmm. but it's to kind of say there's a problem of plastic waste. How do we, um, you know, look at maybe kind of formal, quite abstract models of the production of plastic waste? Then we kind of look at people's attempted solutions. And we quite often know that people come up with policies and they're completely ineffective. Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, very specific case study of what works and what doesn't work. So, of course, she did that with commons and looked at where commons were working and where they weren't working, came up with design features, and then they hopefully help us conserve commons more effectively. Mm, Okay. I was interested in the parallel you draw between Eleanor Ostrom and John Dewey in terms of the pragmatism. Yeah. What's what's the connection there? Um, well, I, I've got this. I can. I've never pronounced his name, but um, is it Powell? Dragos Alagica. Yeah. Alagica. So that's very much his insight. Mm. And in you know his wonderful research on the the Ostroms, what he's doing is looking at what they can tell us in terms of governance. And I think his scholarship, in many ways, is coming from the opposite spectrum from me. I'm on the kind of le- left of the Greens, mm-hmm. and he's a kind of Hayek scholar. But I kind of find with his work, um, you know, it goes well beyond, you know, again, markets and states and, and looks at all sorts of kind of approaches. And he's kind of saying both her and Vincent, Vincent with their Ostromian um, kind of approach, They've got a kind of whole social philosophy. They were very concerned with methodology, um, you know, the, the um, uh, you know, philosophy of social science. So what she's kind of doing is saying um, there's a practical problem, and the practical problem was how do we govern the commons? Um, you know, we can't just privatise them or nationalise them. If we could do that, it would be very easy. But we can't get away from the more difficult problem of governance. And then she's looking at how we do that. And what she's doing is actually having some quite sophisticated philosophy to back this up. So what Paolo is doing in his book is to say, what are the kind of philosophical underpinnings of this? And okay, and when they write, they're referencing economists like um, James Buchanan, who's very interesting, Hayek to a lesser extent, Tocqueville to a you know large extent, you know Jane Jacobs to a little bit, um, and they don't reference Dewey very much. But what Paul is saying is that you have this pragmatic approach, which is kind of in the air that you know they're drawing on you know American philosophical and political traditions that may be quite distant from us now, um, but, you know, would be very apparent in the 40s and 50s and 60s. So um, what you've got, from my understanding of Dewey, and I'm definitely not a Dewey scholar, is that um, it's about effects. So it's not about identifying universal philosophical truths and concepts that work in all time and space. That, um, you know, without being completely banal, what you're interested in is the effect of the philosophy, and if the effect, if it has a practical beneficial effect, that is closer to the truth. You know, it's it's not the idea that human beings are what some human beings think are as God, that we can know everything. So in that sense, Dewey, you know, who might be seen as the opposite of Hayek, as kind of progressive, and people might challenge that, you know, there's a certain kind of scepticism in there. Um, He's also somebody who is a kind of very much a kind of social reformer. So what's interesting with the Ostroms is quite often they'll be seen as on the right. They might well claim themselves as being on the right as well. But they're dealing with lots of kind of things that we on the left love, like ecology, diversity, multiculturalism, direct democracy. Mm -hmm. Um, So the kind of chewy thing is what are the kind of practical effects rather than, you know, concepts for all time and space. Mm -hmm. Um, It's socially progressive. Um... It may be quite kind of heterodox and diverse that there's not going to be kind of one method. Where, of course, this might be challenged is my understanding is Dewey, um, you know, kind of quite optimistic and statist and so on. I'm not kind of a Dewey scholar, so that might be different. Um, But there are certainly some kind of some parallels. Mm. Let's talk a little bit more about the relationship between Eleanor and Vincent. How did he influence her work? Well, I think it's interesting in terms of biographies and careers. 
um, because I can think another thing we have to talk about is kind of feminism and the way, um, you know, for so long she was marginalised and, you know, then, you know, became such an important figure. Um, and yet another perspective is the way that academia is much more methodologically individualist than anything and we're always looking for an individual scholar. Mm-hmm. Um, and... You know, their approach, as I say, in a sense, was kind of collectivist. They weren't really concerned about their personal biographies and careers. They'd very much work together and work with others. So his approach, um, I think, is generally seen as being um, like more theoretical. Hers is seen as being more empirical. I think there's debates around that. And what he would do, as far as I, I know, as far as I can, from reading his scholarship, which People seem to say, oh, this is very difficult to read the scholarship, but I think it's quite straightforward, and I really wish people would read more of it. I think he's a very interesting thinker. Is that what he's drawing on is traditions of, you know, the American Constitution, the American Revolution, um, you know, kind of republicanism in, in a radical sense, not in a mm-hmm. kind of Trump sense, but in the idea of kind of city-states and self-government, um, you know, the more more interesting bits of kind of classical liberalism. So you think of the American Revolution of 1776 and then the construction of the American Constitution and checks and balances and Tom Paine. And not my area, but he's very much, I think, built on those kind of things to talk about self-governance, diversity. And it's maybe... You know, we view both of them as quite heterodox figures, but it might be seen that he's coming from some quite mainstream traditions in American constitutional law and politics. But he's then saying, well, how does that apply to local government? How does that apply to maintaining forests? So, though I've said he was was maybe more concerned with constitutions than, you know, kind of empirical work, Mm -hmm. you know, he was doing work on water basins and so on from very early on. Um, Her work, I think, kind of draws on that and goes beyond it. So her particular emphasis maybe is more the problem-solving, that you have this problem of you have got land which is common, you've got resources which are common, so if you're coming from a kind of liberal market-based, you can't just have people owning them individually because people can't own rivers. So how do you actually maintain those ecologically? So maybe a bit more than Vincent, she's kind of posing it as a problem. Um, mm-hmm. I've heard quite often, they, one of the their kind of slogans they liked when their keywords was contestation, and they believed in strong debate. And I've read that they had very strong co- contestation. I'd really love to know what they disagreed about. Right, and right, that would yeah, be fun. Yeah. It seems that Vincent, from my understanding, was very much concerned with uh, what is it that helps us maintain a self-governing citizenry? And he built on yeah. the works of Tocqueville, and he really yeah. was concerned about local agency and, and people maintaining their democracies. Yeah. Um, do you think that there was perhaps some kind of confirmation bias in, in Eleanor's empirical work in this sense? Um, was she trying to demonstrate outcomes that are specifically favorable to building a self-governing citizenry? Or was her empirical work uh, a lot more mixed in terms of the outcomes that she found? Um, I think that's a very good question because, um, you know, we all, when we do our research, are in danger of confirming our unconscious biases. You know, it's like my kind of very Althusserian theme that ideology is always, to to a large extent, unconscious. And you wonder whether the more sophisticated your method is and the more diverse your method is, the more sophisticated your defense of ideology there is. Mm -hmm. So I think there's always a risk of that. Mm -hmm. Um, So there's definitely a risk of that and there's Mm -hmm. a suspicion and we must always have to some degree kind of hermeneutics of suspicion. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, it is quite kind of decentralist and self-governed. But I do think that she is there's some chance of kind of escaping purely ideological approaches in that what we tended to have with commons is approaches which are, um, you know, kind of bluntly ideological, that you have Garrett Harding saying, um, you know, the former models prove that it's impossible for human beings to cooperate. Therefore, what we need is kind of a very totalitarian structure. And... What she's doing is then engaging with the kind of formal models, 
looking at their assumptions and then building a bit more play in. So I guess that might involve some unconscious bias to what you already believe. Mm -hmm. But I think that what she's doing is at least engaging with the kind of models in quite a direct way. And then that may open up space for other alternatives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things which, you know, I think all serious kind of Ostrom scholars, whether they're on the left like me or people who see themselves on the right or beyond or whatever, would say is what's absolutely key to their work is polycentricism and diversity. And that what you have to do, what you have to be aware of is that you actually need a diversity which you're not then going to necessarily kind of turn into some, in a sort of Hegelian sense, as some kind of new consensus. But you need to be constantly engaging with um, views you might disagree with, with other theoretical contexts, because that's maybe a way of not removing the problem of, of you know, pre-conscious ideology, but it's a way maybe that we might begin to think about challenging it. But it still seems to me that polycentricity does have some weaknesses. What happens when localities come up with bad rule systems or even oppressive ones? Shouldn't the state step in to create an even playing ground for everybody and monitor experimentation in policymaking at the local level? I mean, I'm not not a radical anti-statist. I'm not a libertarian. I have, probably have quite a bit more sympathy for the state than all the people listening to this. Um, but I think the whole the obvious problem with that is what happens when states mess up. Um, you know that there seems to be um, that it's kind of posed that if you have lots of diversity and doing things this way, they could go wrong. And then you need some higher authority to kind of step in. Um, you know, but states are products of human action, and they go wrong as well. And I think if you're theorising things at the state level, that doesn't presuppose that the state is more likely to get it right than local communities. So that kind of throws up difficulties and dangers. Um, you know, that it, it's always, well, who, who judges? Because whoever judges is a product of social forces, that may end up with them doing things which are wrong. And like I said, I'm not a radical libertarian, um, but maybe um, you know, the states with monopoly of violence and being coercive have got a lot more power to damaging things. And you know, again, I'm, I'm not a Hayekian, but I think we have to acknowledge that there's a knowledge problem and that states might be removed from knowledge at different levels. So to kind of take Ostrom at maybe her most statist, she would say, um, yeah, we can't solve climate change purely at a local level. She would say, we need these kind of global agreements. And, you know, people might be quite surprised by that, because on the left, we would say, well, the global agreements are very much about kind of carbon trading, which, of course, she would criticise as being, you know, that isn't a panacea, that's just one mechanism. And then people on the right would say, even if there's a problem with climate change, this is giving, you know, global governance power, which is so destructive. But she would say, yeah, we, we do need global agreements, but you have to have polycentricism in that you need, um, you know, kind of regional level, you know, European level. Um, she'd talk about the importance of cities. She'd talk about the importance of communities. She'd talk about the, um, the importance of individuals. And if you're kicking out the polycentricism, even if you're somebody who's very, very focused on the state, you're not going to have policies which are effective because the policies um, are entirely abstract and formal if you project them at a, a nation state level or a global level. It's how they actually play out on a local level. So one of the things I think the first time I, I came across um, Ostrom's name was in a um, document called Who's Common Future, which was published, I think, in 1990. Three, which you can find online. So it's kind of people like Nicholas Hilliard. And this was like a critique of the Rio global conferences, global environmental conference, and everybody from Fidel Castro, who is a Marxist, very serious approach to ecology, and I'm not challenging that, to kind of corporations were saying, you know, there's this Rio conference and there's a process. And the Who's Common Future was very much kind of criticising this from a kind of left Ostrom perspective and saying we have to look at things on the ground and we have to look at local communities and that if you have policies, however well-meaning, that are imposed from the centre, 
quite often those can be very damaging to the ecological efforts of local communities. Hmm. What about the social justice implications of the Ostrom's work? Does accepting a polycentric order also mean that we should be open to accepting a diversity of approaches to redistributing welfare? I think I'd come at it from a slightly different direction, that where I am critical of her work, and I think what, what's nice about her work is it's very open to criticism. I think what, what both her and Vince kind of found difficult was for a lot of time people would just see this as so left field or right field they just couldn't engage with it at all and I think they really liked you know if people would come and be heavily critical of it engage with it they'd like that and I think where I would come towards it because you know how you know I would see myself in many ways as a Marxist that might be unusual is that what they weren't doing was looking at things at a more macro level and looking at the kind of structural forces so though it's it's difficult to you know, define analytically social class. There are, um, you know, class forces that um, lead to kind of concentrations of power and wealth. Um, you know, that there's not things happening purely at a micro level. There's various macro levels. And I think that I would say that, um, you know, we need that kind of analysis as well. Um what you quite often get end up with is that with that kind of analysis, though, is kind of misplaced scientism and dogmatism and social engineering. But that's where I would have a kind of critique. Um, I wouldn't kind of kind of pose it as you've got this community and that community, but I'd kind of pose it as that that kind of difficult issue of kind of social forces. But can you elaborate on that? If there are really big, deep structural inequalities in society that are frankly too big for any individual, any one person to overcome, wouldn't the state necessarily be the only entity or authority that is capable of tackling problems at that scale? Um, well, I don't think so. I think the interesting thing is, um, you know, it's rare that you're going to get creative interplay between people who'd come from any kind of Marxist tradition and people who would come from, you know, kind of libertarian traditions. Um, but, you know, the way I would pose it, and maybe it's inadequate, is you have kind of structural forces and social class and macro issues of power. Um, but within Marxist traditions, there's a criticism of the state. Now, of course, the irony is whenever you've had things labelled as Marxists, um, they've then ended up with strongly centralised states. Um, and maybe, um, you know, there's kind of a huge problem there. If you look at a lot of kind of classical Marxism you know, from after kind of Marx died in 1883 towards the First World War, you have kind of Marxist traditions which are entirely scientist and positivistic. Um, but the kind of Marxist approach is to say you have to contest and challenge power structures, but you have to recognise that the state is a product of those power structures. So that may leave us with a kind of void and a problem that what you actually do with this. Um, but it's certainly not on the left purely that you, you know, on the, on the left and on the far left, it's not that the state is seen as something which is a black box. Um, you know, if you look at kind of theorists like Louis, Louis Althusser, a very com, um, controversial Marxist philosopher who I kind of find a lot of inspiration from, he would say one of the things that really went wrong with the 20th century Marxism is they didn't theorise the state. So I would say in a kind of Ostrom sense that what you're doing is posing things as problems and there is a problem of power. And, you know, you have to kind of deal with conservation um, concentration to power. But if you're dealing with concentrations of power, people need to kind of get together to challenge those. And you can then create new structures of power. Um, I don't know if I'm talking too much about this. And I think Ostrom's, there's both, um, you know, weaknesses here and kind of useful, con useful contributions. So I think the, the weakness of having you know, purely methodologically individualistic approach is you cannot um, theorise structures at a kind of higher level. Um, and I think if you just ignore those kind of structural factors, um, they're a lot more dangerous. Um, so I think the fact that they haven't done that is a problem. But then on the other hand, in other ways, they're very attentive to power. So they would look at a micro level 
people's interactions and trust and negotiation. They'd also be aware, um, you know, if you look at um, Vincent Ostrom's work, that it was kind of pro-revolutions, but he would say, um, you know, the kind of following Hannah Arendt, that, that the um, French Revolution kind of went wrong and the American Revolution kind of went less wrong. And he was interested in, um, you know, African anti-colonial figures like Cabral. Um, but he was aware that if you have a revolution that involves violence and certain structures, and you can then re-import um, things which are kind of very oppressive. There's, I mean, one of, I think, the, 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 the tragedies with his stuff is that a lot of his stuff was kind of written as, um, you know, notes and in con- conversations, not all published in books, but there's the um, International Digital Library of the Commons that he and Eleanor set up, and in that, there's like a very nice critique that he has of Lenin. And he's kind of saying, well, I agree with Marxists when they would say they want to wither away of the state. And then he would criticise Lenin. And this would go beyond the kind of standard Cold War scepticism and actually say, well, if you're going to have a revolution and have this social change, you have to think about the kind of institutions that follow. If you're not thinking about the kind of institutions that follow, almost inevitably, you're going to end up with something which is oppressive. Let's switch gears a little bit and talk about your political background. It's interesting you've tackled a lot of these challenges um, in the Green Party. How do you translate such complex ideas from the academy into policy? Um, I think just getting people to think about her work is really difficult. Um, and um, you know, I think in some ways, I mean, there's, there's kind of a couple of diff- there's kind of maybe two stages to it. So. Um, What I've been trying to do is kind of get more people to engage with her work. Um, You know, so it is a sort of kind of political, political academic project. Um, You know, I wrote my um, The Sustainable Economics of Anna Ostrom as a kind of PhD size, 100,000 word expensive Rattlish tome. But I felt that it was just so important to, to write that, um, you know, and certainly not as the last word because other people would have very different interpretations because that's how the sort of Ostrom meta mm-hmm. kind of above this works. So I think other people, you know, do, do other books on her. And then I thought it was important to write something um, more kind of popular and accessible. So the, the Eleanor Ostrom's Rules for Radicals, it's very much addressed to a kind of green left audience. So it's kind of thinking of people in the Green Party and Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonnell. And it's been um, really nice to actually have feedback from John McDonnell, who, you know, is the uh, um, Labour Party um, shadow chancellor and is kind of seen as very much a sort of Marxist figure, um, kind of extreme figure, that he's, he, you know, he loved the book and he was very interested in, you know, how you would... Um, approach things in terms of kind of diversity and pragmatism and so on. Um, so kind of just trying to kind of popularise her stuff, which I think a lot of us are doing in different ways, whether we're, we're coming from kind of more liberal or left or green, um, you know, is really important. Um, but I think we're in our kind of diverse ways. We're then aware of the kind of second stage that um, what all of us tend to do as human beings, whether we're academics or not, is want to kind of capture things in a slogan. So there's a kind of commons movement, um, you know, which is good. So you've got a commons movement where people are talking about imaginative forms of collective ownership, um, you know, looking at copyright um, and, you know, kind of protection of property in ways which, you know, creates more access. You've got um, gross movement, grassroots movements trying to kind of apply this in places like the city of Barcelona. It's kind of big on the Latin American left. Um, but what a, you know, these people are not all doing this, but there's a danger that her work is seen very much as um, we're going to bring in the commons. And, you know, when you look at her work, there's great kind of um, diversity, contradictions, there are kind of silences in it that then get us to think a lot further. And, you know, if I was going to kind of distill one thing where I kind of came in looking at her stuff was, hey, this is the commons. Whereas where I am now is I think what's most interesting is about her kind of general method. So I think the kind of subtleties of what she was up to could be lost. Um, You know, and if we look at 
you know, kind of Marxism and Marx is another example. You've got kind of quite subtle projects that then get distilled to very simple slogans. Um, so I haven't got a kind of neat how I've affected kind of policy with this. Um, but I think having, um, you know, the, 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 the more we kind of um, get people to explore her ideas, we've got to be aware that the danger is they're explored in a very kind of closed one dimensional way. Mm-hmm. So uh, there are no clear policy implications here. So I think there are policy implications, okay. but, the, but it's not things which are reduced to mm-hmm. one slogan. Okay, um, yeah. It's, I mean, I got yeah. my kind of 13 rules. But, you right. Know. Tell us about the 13 rules. Um, so what I thought would be quite fun would be to have 13 because it's a nice kind of witchy number. Okay. And um, to kind of come up to still a few things that I would read from what she she looked at to kind of get people thinking in a more kind of Ostromian way. Um, so, you know, one of them is be specific. And with policy making, it's be general. Um, you know, and that if you want to solve things like climate change and problems with plastics and promote, um, you know, greater democratic engagement, you need to be really, really specific. You need to look at what works and what doesn't work, how it plays out at different levels. Um, another one is institutions matter. So, you know, we know that, um, you know, but to many people, institutions are invisible um, you know, I wonder whether it's just me, but I have a kind of prejudice that in Britain institutions are particularly kind of missing, um, that what we have is kind of formal liberal democracy, um, but we have, um, you know, a state which is very paternalistic. And, you know, in Britain, um, you know, I think people are not really used to the idea of governance, that actually having self-government and participation seems a very, very long way from what we do in Britain. And that it's very much we have like a paternalistic state and then it does things we don't like and we moan about them. Um, So just the idea that there are institutions that work at all sorts of different levels and you could build them up in different ways and have different effects. Um, You know, I I wonder whether it's something perhaps peculiarly ignored by the British, maybe not. Mm. But, um, you know, I I think the very notion of an institution... um, you know, as kind of a set of rules, and then we could redesign the rules and change the rules and get different outcomes, is very different, you know, when you're talking about the state and criticisms of the state, the idea that it's not really an institution, that you've got kind of one blanket solution, and that, um, you know, even if you're very pro-state, it's kind of how might we redesign the state, have different rules, see what happens. Right, right. Let's take a little bit more of a pragmatic challenge to the Ostrom. Suppose that investors are coming to a country and they see this vast constellation of rule systems on the ground. It looks like utter chaos. Doesn't this undermine the rule of law and the underlying pragmatism of the Ostrom's framework? I'm probably not really worrying too much about investors. I must. I'm worrying about things like climate change and so on. Um, I mean, what I would would say is maybe where you do have an issue is you have kind of a decentralised left and a decentralised right and so on. And um, you know, may, there are kind of things like economies of scale that give rise to kind of corporate forces and so on. Um, so we can't kind of dismiss corporate, inve- you know, we can't dismiss the fact that you might need, you know, there are benefits from doing things in a list, in a less right. um, decentralized right. way. Right. Um, but I just think when we're talking about investors, maybe, you know, it's inevitable and we've got Brexit and all of the kind of challenges with that. But, um, you know, maybe, um, you know, we need to get away from thinking about you know, what can these, you know, powerful economic forces gain? We really need these. To what more, what do kind of communities want? So, um, you know, Vincent Ostrom would say um, communities might have a huge diversity of different goals, that they might have equality or ecology. And, you know, I think my, my challenge to a lot of people from a kind of market base is, you know, you're talking about, uh, methodological individualism and polycentricism and so on, but there's a great danger that we end up with, um, you know, this kind of very monolithic, um, you know, needs of, you know, short-term profit. Um, but then maybe how we get beyond that is a problem as well. 
I mean, I think one of the themes I think we'd say is whether you're on the right or the left, that people have particular objectives they want to achieve, and then you get unforeseen circumstances, and that the free market left, uh, the free market right tend to, you know, that, that seems to kind of generate neoliberalism. Mm. And then if you look at the kind of Marxist left, that's, um, that seems to generate stronger states. So for any kind of ideological approach, there are very difficult questions around unforeseen circumstances. What do you think is Eleanor Ostrom's legacy in the social sciences? What sort of research programs has she left open for the future? Um, ah, like everything, I've got contradictory thoughts. I mean, I think what... what um, I think is a shame is that there's a great danger that what we do as academics is kind of um, have a thinker, look at what they've said, interpret in different ways, generally gently kind of worry it. Whereas what she and Vince were really about was um, you've got an area of forest, how do you maintain it? Um, you know, she was very keen on workers' cooperatives, how do you make them work? So what I would like to see from the Ostrom legacy, and I think what, what the Ostroms were about. Um, is that you have like a very kind of practical problem and then you bring a huge battery of kind of methods to it and then you, you know, you look at design rules and you're kind of looking at what people do well and you're trusting the people and then you're feeding back to them. So um, where I think what I'd like to see the most is her kind of approach applied to academic research to education, to how things we do thing do things in British universities, and I think that would be kind of really revolutionary. Um, so what I'd love to do is to kind of see people saying, well, how do we actually apply this stuff to, um, you know, maybe introducing um, more, you know, um, conservation and collective ownership in Britain. Um, you know, if you're looking at, um, you know, workers' cooperatives, what works, what doesn't work. So that, I think, would be really great. Um, and I think beyond that, just getting an idea of what, you know, some people might call this their kind of meta theory, that all these, you know, they're, they're kind of challenged to kind of positivism, their interest in the philosophy of social science, concepts like polycentricism, and really kind of getting, getting people interested in that. Um, I mean, I think the danger is the fact that ideas always get kind of captured and homogenized. And, um, you know, we're, um, you're aware, but kind of 19th century in Britain, you had kind of almost like kind of Victorian green radicalism, and you had figures like William Morris, and you had talk of kind of garden cities. And these things always get very domesticated and simplified. Mm-hmm. Um, what I think they would love sadly that neither of them are with us anymore is the fact that people from quite diverse traditions you know that um you know talk to people who might be more liberal um you know talk to a lot of people like myself who would be very much on the left and might talk to people involved with technology and that there's some quite diverse audiences interested in their work it seems like the key lesson they're teaching us is to abandon dogma and embrace as much diversity as we can and I think at their best, what they're doing is coming up with stuff which is very kind of practical, but it's kind of open. Right. You know, so as you say, there's a risk that there's things that they're interested in. They have like a bias towards kind of decentralization and so on. But I think what they're trying to do is kind of open things up, mm-hmm. trying to think about things in an analytical sense where, um, you know, there's not one fixed solution, but you're always being challenged. Right. Right. Um, you know, they're very challenging thinkers. Fantastic. It's been a pleasure talking with you today, Derek. Thank you so much for coming over here. It's been a pleasure being here. (laughs) To all our listeners, you can find more podcasts, blogs, and live events on the cutting edge debates and governance by following us on Facebook and Twitter. Our handle is CSGSKCL. We look forward to seeing you again soon on the Governance Podcast.